What's going on guys? This is Rob and as promised, it is Sunday. So we are starting Secret Invasion. Now, the last time we did this, we did it all as one video, which was about 20 minutes long. We're actually gonna do this more in depth and we're just gonna kind of break it down piece by piece over multiple videos. So in this video, we're basically going to discuss how it was that Secret Invasion happened in the first place. So this may be familiar territory to a lot of you guys out there who are familiar with my channel, but what this does is this initially picks up on Tarnax 4, which is basically the home world or the throne world of the scrolls. Now, one of the things that I want to establish right off the bat, some of you guys in your travels may have heard of a world called Scrollos, which is the home world of the scrolls. That's where they originated from. So think of it like humanity originated on earth, but we decided to colonize some other world that exists out there. And then we moved the capital of our people to like that world. That's basically what happened here. But the important thing is that this takes place in the aftermath of the Kree scroll war. Now that was a conflict that had actually been going on for millions of years and it has an origin that we're not going to go into here in this story uh but the important thing is that the kree scroll war was effectively ended really through a combination of different things that all kind of happened at the same time the arrival of captain marvell from the kree the dark phoenix saga different things like that but the reality of this is that the scroll empire is reeling from their defeat basically facing off against the Kree that was done at the hands of some of the involvement of people on Earth. Particularly when it came to Earth, they view it as a backwater world. And so because of that, it would basically be like the United States having the greatest military might in the world being defeated by people with pitchforks, right? It would just be like a huge just slam to the ego. And so what this does is it leads to a discussion between Emperor Dorek and his military on whether or not they should directly target Earth. But fortunately for them, Earth comes to them and it comes in the form of the Illuminati. Now, this is technically, this comic we're covering right here is technically the Illuminati one shot. And for those of you guys who aren't really familiar with that, when the Illuminati were initially introduced into Marvel Comics, the original one shot story was actually a story that was part of the original Civil War event. And the idea is that you basically had Reed Richards, you had Iron Man, Namor the Submariner, Mariner, uh, Black Bolt of the Inhumans, Doctor Strange, and Professor Xavier, who all came together in Wakanda, and Black Panther literally told them, do not do this, it's not going to work, it's going to end up with calamity, uh, but they basically came together in Wakanda so they could operate off the grid, and decided that because the Kree Scroll War had come so close to destroying the world, that because they all had little pieces of information, Xavier dealing with the Phoenix Saga, the Avengers and Fantastic Four dealing with Marvel, that had they shared that information, the conflict never would have come as close to Earth as it did. And so coming together as the Illuminati, the idea is that no one's going to know they exist, but they're always going to keep information shared and they're going to secretly manipulate things behind the scenes. As you can probably imagine, it ends up disastrous. But the first thing they did was show up here to the planet of the scrolls and quite literally like Reed Richards is like, I came here to tell you that we will not tolerate another invasion attempt on Earth. If you even so much as approach Earth space, it will force us to gather and come to you with manpower that you could not even imagine and the response by xavier is like this is a warning and of course tony stark chimes in and says do not come here or we will destroy your people now here's an important distinction to understand on earth that can be done some of the most powerful beings that exist in the entirety of marvel comics exist on earth the molecule man who can alter reality on a multiversal scale he exists on earth franklin richards who can alter reality on a universal scale he's from earth he got all kinds of stuff and emperor Dor does not take this lightly, but he also won't take it sitting down. And that's one of the things where he's just kind of like, here's the thing to understand. Now that you've come here and you've made that threat to us, we weren't really sure if we were going to invade your world before. We're going to now. Like, this is not something that I'm just going to idly sit by and let happen, which makes sense, right? A man doesn't walk into another man's house and start telling him what's what. And that's exactly what's going on here. And so as a result of that, the Illuminati basically destroy the vessel that Emperor Doric is sitting on right they just eradicate the entire vessel itself blow the whole thing to pieces and fly out in their spacecraft now of course this leads to the entire scroll armada just chasing after them right because while Doric isn't killed trying to assassinate their leader in that way is no small thing right that's a massive event and because it leads to the entire scroll armada following them one of the things to know is that while earth has the most powerful beings in existence it is not the most technologically advanced
man's place in the universe. The scrolls have been around for millions of years, the Kree just as long. And so what you're talking about are people with just the ability to achieve interstellar travel and the defensive and offensive capabilities to go with it. But the thing about this is that because they're so much more technologically advanced than the Illuminati or really there's anybody on earth, they overtake their ship quite readily and try as he might, Iron Man tries to get them out of there, but it ultimately doesn't work. And what it does is it leads to the scrolls basically taking the Illuminati and then analyzing their individual bodies. They basically go through to try to understand Reed Richards. Now, when it comes to the scrolls and Reed, because guys like, uh, like Clerk, who was the original super scroll, basically a, a scroll that had all the abilities of the Fantastic Four, which was really done more through science magic than anything else. It basically led to them having involvement with the Fantastic Four, becoming aware of Reed more than anything else. Another particular important thing about Reed is that he's the smartest person in the universe. So literally every race across the universe knows how capable and intelligent Reed Richards is. So his intelligence respected, but at the end of the day, the scrolls really function in the capacity of just trying to figure out a way to destroy the various powerful beings that exist on earth more than anything else. And so they're literally going through and analyzing each and every one of these guys. And they talk about the nature of them. For example, they don't understand how Black Bolt's vocal cords work, right? How is it that he's able to emit a quasi sonic scream? And one of the discussions by the science guys is like, could we just rip his vocal cords out? And the answer to this is no, if we did that, because we don't know how they work, we could eradicate this entire area where the throne resides. We would kill everybody here. We don't know if that would be the case or not. What's particularly interesting to them is Tony Stark, because when they look at everybody else and they all have powers, they look at Xavier and they're like, okay, so his powers are tied to his genome, right? That's not very difficult. Now, of course, just kind of a sidetrack, this story here and the entirety of Secret Invasion takes place before the events of what are happening right now in Marvel Comics, which is Avengers versus X-Men versus Eternals, where they're actually changing the nature of how mutants came into existence in the first place. So um, it's not it's not an important thing for this story, but just kind of clarifying things for people who were sort of new to Marvel Comics in terms of what's going on now and Secret Invasion. But the thing about this is that Tony Stark's really fascinating to them because he's just a guy, right? He has no powers. He's just a dude who wears a metal suit. And like, that's it. And even to the scrolls, Tony Stark's Stark tech, his Iron Man suit is not that technologically advanced. And that's kind of the funny thing is because of events like Secret Invasion, Tony Stark actually modifies his Iron Man suits so they become more advanced and can actually rival the technology of other races that exist out there in the universe. It's just one of those instances where Tony Stark is always learning and always improving. But the funny thing about this is that while Tony Stark's being held prisoner, he's suddenly rescued by the Avengers who seemingly come out of nowhere. Now, the funny thing here is we would look at this and say, okay, cool, the day's saved. But what's really wild about this is he's like, okay, so here's the thing about you guys. He's like, you guys always underestimate your opponents. It's why you lost the Kree Scroll War. So the question that I have to ask you here is how dumb do you really think I am? And this is when we find out it's not the Avengers. It's scrolls posing as the Avengers. Now, this is a really, really cool moment because this is kind of the, the precursor to Secret Invasion. And it's sort of setting the stage for like what the scrolls will eventually end up doing, which becomes incredibly awesome when it happens. But the reality here is that's when the scrolls kind of start bickering. Like, I told you this was a bad idea. We never should have tried to do this to get information. Now, them trying to get information out of them will be a very key component to what's going on here. But the thing to understand is that because Tony Stark, at least with his combat training, is able to overpower these scrolls, it of course allows him to basically grab some guns, start shooting the place up, and start freeing each member of the Illuminati, who of course helps to free the other members as they're freed themselves. And of course, this basically leads to them basically making their escape here. But the problem here is they're back on the chase trying to get away from the scroll armada. If they couldn't get away before, there's no reason to believe that they can get away now. The funny thing about this is that what they end up doing is basically creating a kind of illusion using a combination of Professor Xavier's telepathic abilities and Doctor Strange's magic. And what they end up doing is literally casting this illusion of Galactus appearing. Now, there's a reason why they chose this, and I'll talk about that here in a second, here in about one or two minutes. But what this does is it basically leads to the Illuminati making their escape by way of the Galactus illusion. And then in turn, we switch back to the throne world. And what we end up finding out is that they basically got exactly what they needed. What they were looking for was the ability to duplicate superheroes. They were looking to understand exactly how their powers worked. Now, the problem with this is that this project sort of falls slightly to the wayside. It becomes just kind of like a background science project while the scrolls are working on rebuilding their empire. But what ends up going on is that around this time, this leads to the introduction of Varenki. Now, in order to understand Varenki, we have to do a little bit of history when it comes to the scrolls, right? So the way this works out is if 
you guys are familiar with probably the Marvel Cinematic Universe or Marvel Comics or anything like that, you guys are aware that on Earth, in the early days of humanity's existence, the Celestials visited Earth and they created the Eternals, the Deviants, and then modified the genes of humanity so that at some future point in time, they would develop powers, i.e. the origin of mutants in Marvel Comics. Earth was not the only place they visited. And in fact, the Scroll homeworld of Scrollos way back when was one of the places they visited. The difference here is that unlike Earth, where the Eternals and the Deviants engaged in some kind of a war with humanity sort of being caught in the middle, and then the Deviants were all but just destroyed when they tried to destroy the Celestials, when the Celestials arrived on Earth for a second time. Unlike that, when it came to the Scrolls, what you had were two people. You had Clibben and Sligurt, and I know their names are really, really weird. Sligurt led the Deviant Scrolls, and Clibben led the Eternal Scrolls, and then you just had normal scrolls. They don't matter. And the reason why is because as soon as the Deviant Scrolls came into existence, they eradicated the normal scrolls. They were just totally destroyed. And they did it by literally just pretending to be normal scrolls and then just assassinating people every chance they got. And Sligurt was the one who led the entirety of the Deviant Scrolls. Now, Clibben was the one who led the Eternal Scrolls. And once the Deviant Scrolls had basically eradicated all the normal scrolls, they killed all but one of the Eternals, which was Clibben. And what ended up happening is that Clibben actually orchestrated a ceasefire and he effectively married Sligurd and then they ascended into godhood according to the stories. But the reason why that matters is because when it came to that essence, that kind of rising to godhood, one of the things that Clibben and Sligurd had done is they had kind of written out this prophecy that foretold that the entire nature of the scroll race is that it's to extend into the universe and then eventually take over the entirety of the universe. So for the scrolls themselves, they see the universe being ruled by them as their divine right, right? Like literally their gods told him it would happen. And so this gave birth to what's called the Dardvan, which is basically the religious sect of the Scroll Empire. It's not purely science. And so because the Dardvan had always existed, as science began to become more prominent, it began to take a back seat. But Varanki is a member of the Dardvan. She's a member of their religious sect. One of the things that had been prophesized in addition to the idea that the Scrolls would basically go into space and conquer the universe is that at some future point in time, the Scroll race itself would be eradicated by what was called quote unquote a devourer and then a wave and that's basically what Varenki is talking about here that she kind of pops back up again and is like look like with my religious sect behind me Emperor Doric you have to listen our people are going to be destroyed we have to leave this world right we have to leave this place right if we don't leave the prophecy will come true and the entirety of our people will be destroyed the issue with this is that it creates a bit of a civil war where Emperor Doric basically labels Varenki as an insurrectionist and a religious zealot, his people basically conquer and imprison her people and then essentially just throw them away on some desert world where they're basically left to die. And so what this does is it switches over to the experiment that the scrolls are conducting with trying to find a way to successfully duplicate superheroes. And the thing about this is that because of everything that Varenki said, it kind of resonates with Emperor Dorek. And so what's been going on here is that with the experiment involving Reed Richards, who they successfully duplicated, what they do is they literally have these situations where Reed is just kind of cloned over and over and over again. And each time he's introduced to his family and his family's so happy to see them. And then they're kind of like, you know, tell us about Galactus. Tell us everything you know about Galactus. And the reality is like Reed sometimes just doesn't know anything about Galactus or he doesn't know anything about something else. But the truth is that every time they clone him, he just simply doesn't have the information that they need because that information was not carried over in the cloning process. And so these members of the Fantastic Four the family that's here to see Reed, it's just scrolls impersonating, and Reed himself is literally just a clone. That's the whole idea. Clone superheroes, and then see if they can replace superheroes using clones. Now, the kicker to all this, and the concern about Galactus, comes by way of basically Brian Michael Bendis in this story, invoking a previous story that was written in 1983 with Fantastic Four issue 257. And what ended up going on here is that, in effect, Galactus arrived at the throne world of the scrolls. Now, this is important because one one of the pieces of technology that the scrolls had was the ability to cloak their world because it's not the first time galactus came riding by right it's not the first time that galactus appeared near them and the prophecy being what it is if nothing else they were always just taking precautionary measures the reality here is that in that story they essentially missed their chance to cloak their world but even if they had it wouldn't have made any difference because frankie ray who is the herald of galactus at the time knows exactly where the scroll throne world is and led galactus straight to it so there was no way for them to hide anyway the end result being that Galactus basically annihilates the entirety of the throne world. Now, what was left of the scroll race, which was literally just 
kind of a, a military led hodgepodge of the group. What ended up happening is they just kind of limped on and then tried to restore their, their race back to greatness. But then Annihilation happened when the villain Annihilus led the Annihilation wave across the universe and almost killed everything. And that all but destroyed what was left of the scroll race. So all you really had with regards to the scrolls was basically just a ragtag bunch of scientists and the continued attempt to like find a way to duplicate Earth superheroes. But this ultimately leads to the science division and even those members of the scroll race who were still alive reaching out to Varenki and bringing her back from the desert world where she officially becomes empress of the scroll race. So for those of you guys who read Secret Invasion and you were wondering how she became the leader during Secret Invasion, this is exactly how. But there's also major changes that have taken place, major progressions to this project that simply weren't there before. And so one of the things we find out is that one, their group has basically moved to Tarnax 10. That's their new homeworld, right? Tarnax X. But the other thing is that Varenki is informed by the science officer of the scroll race that because of all these advancements, they no longer have to traditionally clone superheroes the way they did before. They don't have to clone Reed Richards and then try to get information out of him. Instead, they can just use their shape-shifting technology. Now, one of the big things here is that when it comes to the Deviant Scrolls, shape-shifting is one of their powers. The issue is that if a scroll were to just shape-shift and then go to Earth and then just say, hey, everybody, I'm Tony Stark, because they're not actually Tony Stark and because they don't know the mannerisms of Tony Stark, people who know Iron Man would immediately pick up on the fact that it's not actually him. Kind of a sixth sense, if you want to call it that. To say nothing of telepaths who could read his mind and immediately know that it's a scroll and not actually Tony Stark. And so in order to get around this, which this is a genius maneuver, in order to get around this, what the scrolls are basically doing here, at least what they have been doing, is traveling around and snatching up members of the superhero community, bringing them to the scroll homeworld, and then basically having scrolls turn into those guys. And one of the things that they say is they basically refer to like the newest scroll they have. And we're literally told, this is the model for our new super scroll. Though he resembles the physical attributes of the warrior clerk and his faux Fantastic Four powers, that was for the most part scientific trickery. This is the real deal. Any human or mutant who we can strip a DNA sample of, we can now utterly duplicate their abilities. Any mix or match of any kind, or if you want, just a hyper-powered Reed Richards or Ben Grimm, we can do that too. But like Clerk displayed for many years, we believe that a warrior with a mixture of power attributes reveals itself to be a much more established threat the more weapons a warrior has, and ultimately, the better they become. Now, that's where things get really interesting, because again, they hit on the idea that they can't simply just shapeshift, that in order for this invasion to happen, in order for them to literally invade Earth, replace superheroes, and then essentially conquer Earth, which they see Earth as their prophesied new home, that a scroll has to literally become that person that their mind has to be altered. They have to actually believe that's the case. And so one of the things that ends up happening, and I'm not going to show you who this person is, but one of the things that ends up happening is that there is a person who is already on Earth who is a scroll and has been there for quite some time and has been operating behind the scenes for quite some time. But this person appearing here and showing up and basically offering testimony shows that the project works, that the scrolls using this process can can infiltrate Earth. They can pretend to be anybody they want to, including a powerful being, a person whose abilities they can copy, and they can do this without any telepath knowing that they're an actual scroll. They can do it without Wolverine or somebody with enhanced senses being able to pick up on the fact that they smell different. They can literally avoid any and all forms of detection. No one will ever know they're an actual scroll. And so in the end, you do have Varenki who basically tells them, when I was cast out, right? When I was cast out and I was sent to that desert world, the empire continued to limp wands, which means I'm not really needed here. Instead, I'm needed on the front lines. I myself am going to go to earth. And and when the question's asked, what physical form would you like to take? She chooses it, but I'm not going to show you guys what it is. No spoilers down in the comments section, but I'm curious to see if you can figure out what form Varenki takes. What superhero does Varenki basically end up becoming in Secret Invasion? And I will say this, 
it's probably the person you would least suspect. This is where everything picks up, right? This is where the story starts getting really, really good. The other thing that we have to keep in mind though, is that this part that we're gonna cover here with Nick Fury takes place before the events of Civil War. And we'll explain why that matters here in a second. But Nick Fury is basically underground. Now, all this is really the aftermath of a story called Fury's Secret War, which is basically where Nick Fury launched an unsanctioned attack against Latveria, which was not ruled by Doctor Doom at the time, but because it was unsanctioned and things basically went south, it ultimately led to him being kicked out as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and then a warrant being put out for his arrest, after which point he just kind of disappeared. He just went underground, which is where he's at right now. But the other thing about this is that this also deals with the arrival of Valentina, right? Like Contessa Valentina. You guys know her from the Marvel Cinematic Universe because she's being played by Julia Louise Dreyfus. In the comics, her and Nick Fury have had a kind of on-again, off-again romantic relationship. And if anything, it was really one out of necessity, right? They were both basically just pumping each other for information, but both were kind of on board with it because I guess they just wanted to bang. But one of the things that Contessa reveals is that in the aftermath of, of Fury's Secret War, that Maria Hill has been promoted to Director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and everybody who knows Nick Fury has basically been suspended indefinitely from S.H.I.E.L.D., the only exception being Dum Dum Dugan, just because of the fact that he was Fury's right-hand man. And it's better to have Dum Dum Dugan on board because Dugan's alliances are to Fury, but they're also to doing the right things, so he could kind of go either way. But the thing about this is that, of course, the two of them end up spending the night together. And then when they wake up, the next morning, Contessa tells Fury she's going to go get breakfast. Now, one of the things to know about Nick Fury, because in Marvel Comics, what you have right now is you've got like the black guy Nick Fury, right? Samuel Jackson Nick Fury or Nick Fury Jr. as they call him. This is back in the day when you had like the old white guy Nick Fury. And so what this means is that this version of Nick Fury was always suspicious of everybody and he would literally just stay suspicious until you gave him a reason not to. Now, a lot of that's just because of his time fighting in World War II with the Howling Commandos, becoming a CIA agent, then become director of SHIELD that kind of a thing. So his life is literally just mired in war and in suspicion. And the result of this is that when Contessa leaves, he activates a device on his wrist that allows him to bend light around him, making him invisible, and then follows her. And what he realizes is she's actually meeting with somebody who appears to be part of just some group out there that maybe has it out for Nick Fury or whatever the case is. But the kind of things they're saying confirm the suspicions of Fury when they're saying things like, well, I have his trust, give me time and I'll get the information we need, so on and so forth. But I Obviously, this is either not Contessa or Contessa is working and turning against Fury and is likely going to try to turn him over in some capacity. And so when she arrives, Nick Fury is already ready. He's literally got a gun in his hand. He's sitting in a chair and he's like, who are you really? And of course, one of the things to know about Fury is he'll ask that question a couple times. If Nick Fury asks you that question, who are you really? Assume it's rhetorical. Assume he already knows the answer, that you're not who you claim to be. And where she tries to sort of dodge and bob and weave and like, what are you doing? Put the gun down like that kind of a thing. He literally is just like one more time. Who are you really? And he's showing no signs that like he kind of believes her or she's getting him to let his guard down. You know, it's one of those things where he's like, who were you really? And when she doesn't answer the question, he immediately shoots her and she turns into a scroll. And that's what, when Marvel basically confirms, Nick Fury is the first one to figure out that scrolls are invading Earth. He's the first one to find out what happens. Now, in terms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that's probably gonna end up happening with Samuel Jackson. He's gonna be the first one to realize what's going on. So they're basically taking the element of this story and carrying it over to the MCU regarding his character. But following that, he basically goes to a rooftop. He spies on the guys that the scroll was meeting with and he realizes they're speaking in a scroll dialect. So he's like, okay, she's not the only one. It's not a one-off, right? Like there are multiple scrolls on earth. Now the question is, what do they want? And so what he ends up doing is he actually breaks into the shield helicarrier, like its main base of operations. And when he gets in, he starts talking to like Maria Hill. Now that's the other thing about Nick Fury. Nick Fury was ridiculously capable. And it's kind of funny because he basically knows shield inside and out because a lot of the systems that shield uses, he developed or had them developed for shield. So he literally he knows all the back doors. He knows how to sneak in. And even when S.H.I.E.L.D. went back and modified the systems, because obviously, why would you move into a house and never change the locks when the previous owner leaves? That even all of that, Nick Fury's so capable, he can still get in undetected. That's just how good he is as an agent, right? He's just that capable. And so Maria Hill is initially taken off guard, but Nick Fury does not come here to provoke a fight. He comes here to basically tell her, there's some things you need to do, right? Because remember, this takes place before Civil War. So for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with what that means, 
During the events of Civil War, because Maria Hill had effectively just bungled the entire superhero conflict, and because she operated with too extreme of a hand, in a lot of ways, it was her feeling underestimated by the people around her, so she was just overcompensating and torpedoed her career in the process, that Tony Stark ends up becoming the new director, which is actually what you'll find when we transition into the next part of the story in this video. But the thing about this is that at this point in time, she's the head of S.H.I.E.L.D., right? She's the one running the show. And so that's why Fury's like, now that you have this gig, now that you have this this job, Fury 1 already knows she's not a scroll, right? He's looked into her, and we'll find out how he does that here in a second, but he basically already looked into her. He knows that it's actually Maria Hill. He literally tells her, you're surrounded on all sides by people who have it out for you, i.e. Nick Fury saying, there are a ton of scrolls on this ship. He's not telling her they're scrolls, but he's like, there's a ton of people here who, are, who have it out for you, and it's only a matter of time before they make that move against you. Number two, whenever you have that itch on the back of your neck, that feeling of uncertainty, that's your gut talking to you. Learn to trust it. Learn to believe that and what you need to do is start developing life model decoys make like a dozen of those things right and just start sending them out whenever you're unsure about what's going on whenever you get that little feeling on the back of your neck and your your gut is telling you something's off send a life model decoy in your stead and the last thing he says is like i'm gonna be watching you i'm gonna be keeping an eye on you and if at any point along the line i think you're not who you really are i'll kill you on the spot right like basically if she's replaced by a scroll i will take you out and so maria hill has no idea what nick fury's talking about but one of the things to notice here is that while her loyalties are to shield and while she does does basically activate a code white which is the highest level code they have available like basically this is like an immediate coming together of shield agents everybody mobilize take out that target right just like oh my god like it's a great big huge thing that she also understands the importance of nick fury she also understands the significance of nick fury and he would not break into the shield helicarrier headquarters risk getting caught even though it was never going to happen just to convey those messages to maria hill so she can ignore it, right? Like, it's one of those things where she literally takes it to heart. And so what you end up doing is, of course, Nick Fury just kind of disappears, right? He literally just activates a, a beacon that basically makes him invisible to not only the human eye, but as well as radar. So they just don't know where he went to. He just vanishes like, like a fart in the wind. And so he ends up meeting with Spider-Woman Jessica Drew. Now, one of the things to know here about Spider-Woman is that she was initially brought in by Nick Fury, and she's effectively a spy. Initially, she was a spy that basically worked on behalf of Nick Fury infiltrating Hydra, and then she was a spy for S.H.I.E.L.D., which is what she is right now, but she ends up becoming kind of a triple agent, basically working for Nick Fury in the sense that she was spying on Hydra. That's no longer a thing anymore. We'll talk about that here in a minute. She is currently a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, but of course, they're highly suspicious of her because of her history with Nick Fury. Now, Nick Fury basically approaches her and is like, I need you to spy on S.H.I.E.L.D., and I need you to spy on the superheroes, right? On like the Avengers and those groups, and report back to me anything you find. Now, one of the things that Nick Fury also reveals and the way that he kind of monitors Spider-Woman and knows that Spider-Woman is not a scroll is that he's basically been keeping an eye on her for two weeks he's literally just been watching her this whole time watching her movements watching her comings and goings everything and it's kind of a funny thing because nick fury is just that suspicious of everybody he meets but when she starts asking him questions like why do you want me to spy on superheroes and shield and you're basically turning me into a triple agent the response of fury is because it's a much bigger thing and that's all that i can tell you but again it's one of those situations where when nick fury shows up on your doorstep and says i need you to do do something for me, you usually assume it's for the greater good because Nick Fury never really does anything for extremely selfish motivations. He never really does anything to just cover himself up, right? And so ultimately, because of the respect she has for Nick Fury, that Spider-Woman gets on board. And so what this does is it transitions over to a regathering of the Illuminati. Now, this is when we talk about kind of the bigger picture. Anybody who's read anything online about Secret Invasion, most all of you have heard somewhere along the line the idea that the superheroes learned about Secret Invasion because it turns Turned out Elektra was a scroll. So that happened in a new Avenger story. It was a five part story, and we can cover it if you want to, but it has nothing to do with anything until you get to like the last two or three pages when Elektra dies, when the new Avengers launch an assault on the hand, which is like a mystical ninja organization. And when Elektra dies, she turns into a scroll. That's all you really have to know, right? Following that, basically what had happened is Spider Woman had taken the body of Elektra to Iron Man and was like, what in the hell is going on? Like, what is this? Like, why do we have a scroll? on the Avengers team. What's happening here? And so with Iron Man having no idea what was going on with that, he basically brings the body of Elektra to a new gathering of the Illuminati. And when they all come together, they don't even know what's going on, right? Like, like Iron Man's the only one that knows what's happening. And in fact, even when Namor shows up, Namor believes it's the body of Captain America because this segment takes place after the events of Civil War and even after the death of Captain America, which was not technically part of Civil War. But ultimately, Iron Man's like, no, this is a scroll. And so it's kind of like, okay, like, like, 
how did a scroll infiltrate the new avengers and that's the question of tony stark is i don't know like we don't know like we didn't even know she was a scroll nobody knew she was a scroll right like what's going on here when it comes to the new avengers there's two people on that team who would have immediately picked up on the fact that she was a scroll the first was peter parker's spider sense and even if peter didn't know exactly what was going on because every time spider-man looked at electra his spider sense would have gone off even though it just would have seemed weird maybe electra had it out for him he would just kind of be suspicious with wolverine and all of his enhanced senses he would have immediately been able to pick up on the fact that that's not Electra, but for whatever reason and by whatever means the scrolls can evade that the scrolls can literally dodge spider-man's spider sense so it never goes off and wolverine's senses never detect that they're not who they claim to be and so it's one of those things where it's like okay how did this start and that's when iron man's like we're the ones who did it like how do you think it started we caused this and so of course this references the last video we did which of course again you're welcome to check out the playlist in the description so you can keep track of it all so you won't get lost with all the videos that we make here on the channel but in that video, we talked about how when the Illuminati first formed, the first thing they did was show up to the Skrull homeworld and basically tell them, if you bring your war with the Kree close to Earth like that again, we will annihilate all of you. And the response of the Skrulls basically took them captive and then started basically working on their genes or trying to find a way to understand their genes. And then at a future point in time when the Skrull world was destroyed by Galactus, that the Skrulls began the process of replacing superheroes on Earth. And so where the members of the Illuminati are kind of full of hubris and are just sort of like, no, nah, man. Man, like all we did was go there and warn them and that kind of a thing iron man's like no we caused this like we're the reason why this happens we can't tell anybody that right we can't tell anybody that we're the reason this this whole thing happened but at the end of the day we're the reason behind it all now the other thing that's kind of interesting here is a lot of members of the illuminati are kind of like okay well what if it's just one like what if what if it's just a scroll like a rogue scroll that defected from the empire for whatever reason and basically just took over you know just replaced electra right like which by the way where is the real electra and it's kind of like i don't know she's missing or she's dead like i have no clue where she is all i know is like she's just the electra here right that's iron man's response like it's just the scroll that we see in front of us but the other thing that iron man says is like this is the one we found but we have to assume there's more we can't just look at this electra scroll and see it here and say well we'll we'll worry about it if it happens some more we have to assume that there are more scrolls that are that have infested earth in some capacity and so as a result of that basically the entire reality of the situation hits home when you have this discussion or really this moment where Black Bolt, which is probably one of the, the only three moments in Marvel Comics when he's ever been cool, uh, when he basically like speaks, right? And literally says actually, I have a better idea. I take the body and your people die so that my people can live. Now, here's the reason why that matters and it catches the entirety of the Illuminati off guard. Because Black Bolt has a quasi-sonic screen. That's the reason he doesn't talk. Because if he were to talk, he'd probably kill everybody in the room. But the fact that Black Bolt can speak without basically putting off or really just releasing his voice tells them right off the bat, that's not Black Bolt. But even that realization is irrelevant because as soon as it happens, he basically lets off an enormous amount of energy that doesn't really kill everybody here, but certainly incapacitates them for a moment and takes them off guard. Now, of course, they're basically shielded just because of their insanely fast reactions. But this scroll, and it's one of the cool things about it, because this scroll had replaced Black Bolt, remember, when the Secret Invasion Project was undertaken by the Scroll Empire, they have the ability to mix and match powers however they see fit. So they could literally create a scroll or give the abilities to a scroll that has the powers of Spider-Man and Wolverine all rolled into one if they chose to. In this instance, because this scroll is infiltrating the Illuminati, it has all the powers of the Illuminati. It's got the telepathy of Charles Xavier, the strength of Namor the Submariner, the elasticity of uh, of Reed Richards. Like, it has all those things, right? Even the quasi-sonic scream of Black Bolt. Of course, in this instance, it can control the scream instead of it controlling him. But where you end up having Professor Xavier that tries to uses telepathy on this guy in order to bring it down, it doesn't work, right? Like Xavier's telepathy does not work at all. And in fact, this guy is able to provide a telepathic feedback loop that's basically two brick walls smashing into each other. But the scroll is able to overcome it and Xavier is temporarily incapacitated. Which by the way, for those of you guys who are curious how it is that Professor Xavier is walking, basically when he came back after the events of House of M, he had regained his ability to walk. There's the answer to your question. So the thing behind this and what's really crazy here is Dr. Doom encases this guy in the Crimson Bands of Sidorak, which he's able to break out of, right? This guy's strength is on a whole different level. And so ultimately, Namor the Submariner breaks this guy's neck and then throws him onto a piece of rebar and basically just kills him on the spot, right? Now, of course, this pisses off Iron Man and them because it's like, okay, like this guy had information. But what we end up finding out is this is not the only one like him. And in fact, there's multiple scrolls who are basically agents there to take out the Illuminati, all of whom are just as capable as that guy is. And so with the group struggling against one, having to face off against two or three is even more complicated 
complicated than that, and there's no real discernible way for the group to make it out alive, so Iron Man does the only thing he can do. Because of the fact that this fight with that first scroll had depleted his energy down to like 20 something percent, and his suit was not able to maintain, he tells the Illuminati to get out of there as fast as they possibly can. He taps into a nearby nuclear reactor, like he literally supercharges his armor and then just lets off all this atomic energy in a massive blast. Now, the funny thing about this is no one knew that Iron Man can do that. This is one of those instances when Iron Man is basically given a new power that we never saw before. So it is cool to be able to see him tap into a nuclear reactor, absorb all that nuclear energy, and then let it off in the form of what's effectively a small scale, like a small yield nuclear warhead. It's pretty awesome to see because he's basically now a walking, talking nuclear nuclear bomb, so that's kind of nuts, but Iron Man also says, like, the scrolls didn't know that I could do that either, but now they do, and now that they do know, it won't work twice, it's not gonna work again, so this is kind of Marvel's way of saying, like, you're never gonna see this power again in Marvel Comics, at least not in the form of this story, but the important thing here, and what's really crazy, is Xavier picked up on something, that when Xavier tried to read the mind of that scroll, he came to this realization that, yes, the scroll replacements, or duplicates, if you want to call them that, were able to dodge the abilities of, like, Spider-Man and Wolverine, and being able to detect that they were actual scrolls, but they can also dodge the telepathic abilities of telepaths indirectly. And the reason why is because telepaths basically rely on, of course, the mental patterns, the thoughts you have going on in your head to understand what's happening here. But what Xavier says is that scroll believed he was Black Bolt. Like that scroll legitimately thought he was Black Bolt and in turn turned against all of us. Now, of course, in that moment when that scroll turned against them, its true thoughts became manifested, its true thoughts were real. But what Xavier is saying here is that when they all came together in the first first place, and Xavier was reading the thoughts of Black Bolt before he turned, before he revealed, him, uh, revealed himself as a scroll, in order to know what Black Bolt was thinking in their meeting, as far as Xavier was aware, that was Black Bolt. So until such a time as a scroll reveals their true motivations, and actually activate themselves and reveal themselves as a scroll, and stop being the person they're pretending to be, there's no conceivable way for a telepath to know that it's actually a scroll. That's why this is a secret invasion. That's why the secret invasion event even happened in the first place because there's no way for the superheroes on earth to basically detect that a person is an actual scroll what this does is it basically starts to destroy the trust between the members of the illuminati which had already walked a knife set right they already came together but they did it because they felt like they had to not because they truly wanted to and because that trust was already so flimsy in the first place now that they're all facing this situation where the reality is any of them could be a scroll there's no way to know for sure name with a submariner is the first one to be like i don't trust any of you here and he leaves and that sows the seeds of doubt among the rest of the team because while they don't openly come out and say it it's literally the standoff at the end of the good the bad and the ugly they're all just kind of looking at each other and it's like are you a scroll i don't know are you a scroll like it's a more serious version of like the spider-man meme that's basically what this is and so ultimately even if only for a temporary moment the entirety of the illuminati seemingly disband so what we do here is we initially pick up with tony stark meeting with reed richards and hank Pym. now here's the thing the way that tony stark talks to reed richards and simply saying that like you and hank pym are the smartest like two of the smartest men in the world and that's why i'm bringing this to you reed richards is surprised by the fact that like electra is a scroll now those of you guys who have followed our coverage so far reed richards already knows this because he's a member of the fantastic four and he's a member of the illuminati so pray tell why reed richards is surprised in this story to learn that electra is a scroll because brian michael bendis is writing it and if you don't know anything about marvel comics this is something that you need to be aware of. Brian Michael Bendis is notorious for two things putting way more text in a comic than he needs to, and ignoring stuff. Sometimes, Brian Michael Bendis will ignore the things he wrote, which this is a perfect example of it. The alternative is the excuse that we as fans made up, which is that Reed Richards is pretending, because nobody's supposed to know he's a member of the Illuminati. So in front of Hank Pym, he's acting like, oh man, this is crazy, I can't believe something like this happened. Good thing I didn't know about it beforehand, because now I can do whatever it is that I need to do in order to find some way to stop this. It's the only way that we know how to rationalize it as fans. That's why a lot of us were just really excited when Bendis left and went to DC, and then he screwed up Superman. But the thing about this is that once that revelation is brought forward, this switches over to the peak, because Stark bringing this to the, the attention of Reed and Hank Pym is that they can put their minds to task, and they can figure out how it is that Elektra was able to be replaced by a scroll, and that scroll was able to avoid the detection of virtually everybody. But for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with the peak, this is the main base of operations for the Sentient World Observation and Response Department. Now, this group is similar to S.H.I.E.L.D., but not directly. So, S.W.O.R.D. was created 
created out of S.H.I.E.L.D. That if S.H.I.E.L.D. monitors the various threats that exist on Earth, then S.H.I.E.L.D. came to the realization, and really even Nick Fury himself came to the realization, there needs to be an organization that monitors threats in space. Hence the reason why S.W.O.R.D. was born, and that's literally what they do. They just monitor as much of space as they possibly can because they can't see it all, and they basically keep an eye on whatever threats may be approaching Earth, right? So like, if Galactus is coming to Earth, S.W.O.R.D. will know about it, and then they'll just have to evacuate because there's basically nothing they can do. But that's the thing to kind of keep in mind here. But S.W.O.R.D. is a very strategic operation in being able to understand what threats exist out there that could potentially be targeting Earth. The kicker about all this is they pick up on basically an object or a ship making its way towards Earth. And what's really crazy about this is Iron Man immediately takes off and then contacts the Mighty Avengers to have them respond, as well as Luke Cage. Now, there's a couple things to understand here when it comes to this segment. First and foremost, the reason why Luke Cage is against this and the reason why his team is referred to as the Secret Avengers is because in the aftermath of Civil War, when basically Iron Man won and he became the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and the 50 State Initiative was invoked and superhuman registration became the law of the land, you had two things that happened. The first is that most all of the Avengers basically went underground. They abandoned the entire role because they didn't want to have anything to do with registration and they steadily stood fast against it. But the other part of this is that with most of the Avengers basically leaving Tony Stark, Tony Stark took those Avengers that were on his side and seeing it as kind of a fresh start, so to speak, basically created the Mighty Avengers. And so the Mighty Avengers, that's the heavy hitting team, right? That's like Carol Danvers. That's the God of War Ares. It's the Century Robert Reynolds. More than enough to handle virtually any threat that could show up on Earth outside of just some crazy level cosmic entity like Galactus, but they're pretty heavy hitters. The kicker about all this is that in order for the Secret Avengers to basically get to where it is that this ship is crash landing at, they basically travel to Avengers Tower. They steal the helicarrier, steal the, the vessel of Tony Stark, and then race off. Now, of course, Tony Stark could basically shut it down remotely. So, of course, they basically deactivate it, right? They deactivate the motherboard so they can basically just travel to wherever it is they need to travel to, and that's it, without having to worry about Tony Stark shutting it down. But the reality here is they ultimately end up arriving in the Savage Land, and they get there, or at least shortly after they arrive there, Iron Man arrives as well. Now, the fact that these guys are all secret Avengers, they defy the whole role of, like, superhero registration and all that kind of stuff, that's the reason why Tony Stark wants to arrest them, right? Because of the fact that they're literally vigilantes in the eyes of the law. And so you do have a bit of a skirmish that kind of breaks out between them, where literally it's superhero facing off against superhero to a degree. It's more of a standoff than anything else. But while that's going on, it's all being monitored by Abigail Brand and S.W.O.R.D. And that's when Dum Dum Dugan, who has historically been one of S.H.I.E.L.D.'s top agents and is really kind of a, a field advisor here on S.W.O.R.D., when it's revealed that he's a scroll. And when Luke Cage pries open this ship, basically rips open the door, it sets off an alarm, and that basically tells Dum Dum Dugan to make his move, at which point he blows up the peak. He literally destroys the sword base. Now, this is huge because what this does is it basically removes Earth's ability to recognize any potential threats coming from space. They won't know anything, right? I mean, there, there's satellite systems and things like that, but the other part of this, and it's really like a multifaceted strike, and it's a genius maneuver by the scrolls. what they also do is Jarvis, who has always been like the butler of the Avengers. In the MCU, he's an AI created by Tony Stark. In Marvel Comics, he's a literal guy. Like, he's a physical guy, an actual butler that basically exists out there. But what happens is he literally uploads a virus to basically the Avengers database, which allows it to not just affect like Tony Stark, but the rest of the world as well. But what it does is it shuts down the armor of Tony Stark, right? So now Tony Stark's entire armor system is nullified. And it's not just that armor, it's every suit of armor he has. There's no redundancies anymore. There's no backups, no nothing, right? Like it's just Tony Stark without any technology at his disposal. It's basically the scrolls launching a multi-pronged strike against the earth, shutting down virtually every technological system they have. And in fact, this whole attack is so intense that Maria Hill, who basically is the kind of interim director of S.H.I.E.L.D. at the moment, with Tony Stark basically off out in the field, that she's literally like, this is a mayday. This is an SOS. We have just complete and total communication failure. And she literally tells everybody on the helicarrier, abandon ship. And the reason why is because the helicarrier has been shut down. And it's just 
crashing into the city of New York, right? Literally getting ready to crash land. The other part of the strike is it takes down the satellite systems of the United States and really the world as a whole. So there's no detection systems whatsoever. The entire technological stance of the earth has been reverted back a few hundred years, but to make everything just to really put the cherry on top, the next part of this strike targets the raft. Now, for those of you guys who aren't familiar with the raft, this was actually the first story that was done by Brian Michael Bendis when he wrote New Avengers. But basically the raft is a super villain prison and the most extreme of these villains, the Molecule Man, Owen Reese, who can alter reality on a, on a universal scale, people like that, right? Victor Von Doom, who's apparently being held prisoner, that they're all held in the sub base. With this virus making its attack, every single person who's part of this base ends up getting freed. And so what it does is it switches over to the Thunderbolts Mountain. Now, for those of you guys who are unfamiliar with Thunderbolts Mountain, and this is a pretty significant thing, Thunderbolts Mountain is basically the, the location of Norman Osborn's Thunderbolts team. That you did have the Thunderbolts who, who existed initially. Thunderbolts returned during S.H.I.E.L.D. under the control of Baron Zemo. In Marvel Comics, post-Civil War, Thunderbolts had basically been modified to where it was more of like a Suicide Squad type team. That basically it's where supervillains would be held and they would be, they would operate as like agents trying to quote unquote atone for their actions. So it still maintained that original charter. The difference here is that under Norman Osborn, this is going to become ridiculously important. And in fact, Norman Osborn is going to prove to be one of the most significant people, if not the most significant person that has a hand in the events of Secret Invasion. I'm not going to go super in-depth into that, but you'll figure it out by the time we get to the end. But the other part of this is we basically switch over to the Fantastic Four. And this shows you just how extensive the scroll's ability to infiltrate society is. The Fantastic Four has some of the most advanced security in the world, so much so that even with these attacks, these strikes happening by the scrolls and taking down like multiple facets of technology across the world, the Fantastic Four are actually immune to it because of the technological advancements of Reed Richards that it basically allows them to operate on kind of a redundant power system outside of any sort of network connection. But scrolls being as they are in this story and being able to operate undetected by any superheroes on Earth, it allows one of them to impersonate Susan Storm to enter into the Fantastic Four and in doing so, basically activate the portal to the negative zone. Now, the reason why this is so huge, those of you guys who aren't familiar with that, the reason why this is big is because the negative zone is composed of antimatter, right? The positive, the, the Marvel multiverse as we know it is composed of positive matter. This is like an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. Say, for example, this portal were to just grow to the size of a universe or something like that, it would negate the existence of the multiverse as a whole. It would destroy everything. Now, of course, the scrolls aren't looking to annihilate all existence across the multiverse. They're simply looking to make Earth uninhabitable. But this is them setting the stage because what it does is it creates a distraction for the Fantastic Four because it literally starts sucking everything in around it. And so to really set things off here and what's really, really bonkers is that once the heroes back in the Savage Land, right, where the vessel had basically crashed, that what this does is it basically shows that like all these different variations of the Avengers start emerging from this ship. You have like the X-Men, you've got like the, the main Avengers roster itself, and you even have just heroes that kind of exist out there, right? People like Luke Cage and so on and so forth. The funny thing about this is that they're all for the most part wearing older costumes. And so it's literally the older superheroes meeting the newer superheroes. The reason why that's such a huge deal is because of the fact that these guys emerge and start talking like they've been kidnapped this whole time, right? They, they're, they're like, oh my God, it's so good to finally make it back home. And so what it does is it starts to kind of beg this question, who's actually a scroll here? Is it like the superheroes who have just been on earth this whole time? Is it the superheroes who are arriving on earth from like this scroll ship? And I know that on the surface right now, it's like, well, it's obvious the ones who arrived on earth from this ship are scrolls. But things are going to get a lot more complicated and a lot messier. But when you switch back over to the Stark lab where you have Reed Richards and you have uh, Hank Pym, that basically Reed Richards figures out how it is the scrolls are able to basically operate without being detected by telepathy or any of that stuff. And as soon as he turns to Hank Pym and tells him that, it's revealed that Hank Pym is a scroll who basically incapacitates Reed Richards and then just kind of leaves it there, right? So what this does here, and this is this is a pretty significant thing, what this does here is it switches over to the main Thunderbolts. Themselves. Themselves. Now, under any normal circumstance, I probably wouldn't cover this just because of the fact that it's like, okay, I mean, it's, it's cool, you know, but like I said, Norman Osborn is going to be a huge player by the time you get to the end of this story. And in fact, it's going to set the stage for 
a whole bunch of stuff that comes after. But what basically goes on here is basically Marvel attacks Thunderbolt's mountain. Now, here's the thing to understand: Marvel's dead. Right, this guy's dead. So obviously this Marvel is either one that somehow returned to life or he's a scroll. The reality is that he's a scroll, right? I mean, we're, we're not really gonna follow his story anymore over the course of this video series. So we can just kind of throw it there. But the reality here is that it takes the entirety of Thunderbolt's mountain by surprise. One, because of the fact that this attack was launched and two, because Marvel died of cancer. It was actually a huge landmark story that Marvel wrote back in 1984 by Jim Starlin, I think, but it was basically called the death of Captain Marvel. The guy died of cancer. And it was one of the first times that Marvel Comics when they introduce a means by which a superhero could die and there's no conceivable way of saving their life. There was no way to stop the cancer in Marvel's body. I mean, I guess you could have, right? Like, here's the Infinity Gauntlet. Let's just fix him, right? But I'm, I'm pretty sure in the story they nullified all possible options and he'd even made peace with it and was just kind of like, okay, it's cool, right? It's my time to go, that sort of thing, and basically just moved on. But Marvel was immensely powerful, right? He had the ability to manipulate cosmic radiation, which made him just hugely capable. Now, a lot of this was because of the Negabands, different things like that that he used. But the fact is, he overtakes the entirety of the Thunderbolts team. And so once the whole team is basically defeated, it leads to Norman Osborn basically stepping up and saying, hey man, so like, you literally just trashed the entirety of my of my whole mountain. Do you want to sit down and have a conversation with it? So I, I know that this is one of those things where it doesn't seem overly important. It seems wildly unnecessary. It'll become very important later on down the line. But jumping back into the main secret invasion story that what it does is picking up in the savage land again on one side you have like we can we can call them like the modern superheroes and we can call the other ones like the older superheroes right just to kind of differentiate between the two and make it easier to keep track of everything the modern superheroes are absolutely certain of the fact that they are human beings who have lived on earth this entire time the older superheroes believe the exact same thing that they are those superheroes as you can imagine it creates a huge sense of confusion now one of the things that happens here is there's a, a few tips that you get right from the modern avengers who are like this is obviously not the avengers team these guys are scrolls one because like captain america is there right by this point in time in marvel comics captain america had already been shot and killed by agent 13 right like he was already dead and out of the picture and so it's one of those things where like the fact that he's here doesn't really make any sense unless that captain america who died was actually a scroll but his body never reverted so he stayed human the whole time whenever a scroll dies they revert back to their scroll form so that indicates this captain america is not actually a scroll and that kind of gives the rest of the team license to believe that all the old superheroes are scrolls and that they as the modern superheroes are actual humans but this is when stuff starts to get murky because some of the scrolls overplay their hand for example one of the scrolls starts talking to robert reynolds now the reality here is this is just brian michael bendis getting century out of the way because if we're being honest with ourselves that guy's powerful enough to end the conflict like that right he could just end it just in an instant but remember the alter ego of robert reynolds is the void right it's his evil persona and the part of himself that he's always trying to keep at bay and so when the vision when when older vision attacks robert reynolds he actually tells him robert reynolds you did all this right lest we forget your alternate ego right the void has the ability to alter reality and i am the void and i did all this because you want wanted it to you wanted it to happen subconsciously and it basically sees robert reynolds take away it's stupid don't get me wrong it's ridiculously stupid right it would be really really cool to see century here here's one of the things to know about robert uh, robert reynolds of marvel comics it's usually whenever he shows up it's pointless because a writer will bring him in and then immediately write him out because a writer will realize oh my god this guy's way too powerful to be here we got to somehow get him out of the story and call it a day and that's exactly what happens here because the century is basically marvel's super man outside of like Hyperion, right? Like the Sentry and Hyperion are just two of the physically strongest characters that exist in Marvel Comics. And in fact, the Sentry has gone toe to toe with the Incredible Hulk multiple times. And in fact, the Incredible Hulk is scared of the Void because of how powerful he is. So this is one of those things to know. But kind of a funny circumstance here is again, at this point in time in Marvel Comics, Hawkeye is operating as Ronan. You guys may remember him from the Marvel Cinematic Universe. But the thing about this is that he observes more than anything else. That he basically subdues his old her counterpart and then takes off in the woods to watch and that's one of the things to know about hawkeye when it comes to how he was written 
following his return in the aftermath of House of M that basically he just kind of observes and watches things. That he doesn't really engage a whole lot in any of these events, but it's just one of those things where he just kind of sees what's going on. Now, Carol Danvers ends up getting Tony Stark to safety, but that's when you start to see the reality of the situation starting to really hone in and box people in. That Tony Stark tells Carol Danvers, okay, look, all of my suits are gone. So I'm gonna use the one thing the scrolls can't duplicate, which is my brain. I'm literally gonna have to rebuild an Iron Man suit from scratch because in the Savage Land, you do have forms of technology. It was used by Magneto as a base of operations at one point. It's been used by other people. They've brought technology there. They've done experiments, different things like that. And so while this technology here in the Savage Land is nowhere near as modern or fancy as Tony Stark's normal tech, it is enough for him to get the job done. But Carol Danvers and hearing this starts to kind of question whether or not Tony Stark is a scroll. And that's when you switch over to like Wolverine encountering Luke Cage. Wolverine's the exact same way. That Luke Cage is like, hey man, it's cool. It's me. Like I'm, I'm just regular Luke Cage. And Wolverine's like, I don't care. Right? I don't care if you're Luke Cage. I don't care if you say you're Luke Cage. I can't trust you. And in fact, Wolverine's going to attack him. Now the response of Luke Cage is, dude, I have indestructible skin. Your claws cannot hurt my skin. And the response of Wolverine is, well, then I got indestructible claws. So I guess at the moment, we're just a kind of an impasse and like, we'll just sort of call it a day. But the, the version of Spider-Man, the older Spider-Man, man is basically just kind of laying there in the aftermath of everything that had happened. He was killed by Hawkeye and is basically re or at least reverts back into a scroll. And so because of that, it's one of those things where Hawkeye just kind of keeps an eye on the situation, but you have older Hawkeye, who's a scroll, who's basically been killed by Mockingbird. And as he lays dying, Wolverine comes to this realization that what's actually going on here with these scrolls is they genuinely believe they're these heroes. Right? That's the reason why they were able to operate undetected is because these guys who were scrolls either don't know they were scrolls or they had their mind modified in such a way to where they genuinely believe they are these heroes. And that's why Wolverine draws this conclusion in saying all the older superheroes are scrolls. If they emerge from that ship, they are scrolls. And that's when he goes racing over to Mockingbird, Bobby Morris, with the intention of killing her. Now, at that point, modern Hawkeye steps in and says, no, 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 you're not going to kill her. And it's like, it's one of those things where he's like, we have to put her to a test, right? We have to test whether or not she's actually Mockingbird. So I'm going to ask her a question. If she can answer this question, then that means that she's actually who she claims to be. And what he does is he says, tell me about October 12th. And that's when we end up learning that Bobby Morse, that Mockingbird, was pregnant at one point in time, and she ended up having a miscarriage and never told anybody. But October 12th is when their kid was going to be born, having mapped out like the actual day of that child's birth, and it would have been a beautiful day. And literally Hawkeye takes out his evidence enough to just kind of be like, okay, because in his mind, he's like, you died, right? Like this baby that we were going to have, like you died. So, so like one, it was a miscarriage, then you were dead. So like, it seemed like there was no conceivable way to put this together. Together, but using those two things, Hawkeye's just like, it's definitely Mockingbird, right? It's definitely her. But that's where the seeds of doubt are being planted because the question here is, is this actually Mockingbird, right? Is it actually her? And like, she was taken by the scrolls or whatever it is. She was held prisoner for any number of reasons and she's actually arrived here on earth and she is an actual human. So this vessel contained a combination of humans and scrolls or is she an actual scroll? And it's just the memories of Mockingbird were put into her head and she genuinely believes she's that person. That's where the seeds of doubt come into play. That's where the question really gets answered. Who's a human and who's a scroll? Who do you trust? And so it's kind of a last ditch action here. What ends up happening is that while the Fantastic Four are distracted with the negative zone portal being open and trying to find some way to shut it down, the scroll vessels start showing up. And when they do, what you end up getting is this colossal scroll invasion of all these different scrolls who all basically have any combination of superheroes that you can conceivably imagine. They're launching their main strike because the whole goal of the scrolls here is to keep the superheroes distracted, to keep them removed from the landscape, and then it's just mop-up duty with the average person, just wiping out and annihilating all the just regular denizens of Earth. So by the time the superheroes come back, or at least they're able to deal with their circumstance, the scrolls can take out most of them, and that actual invading army that we see here will just take out the rest. This basically picks up with the scrolls launching their invasion of Earth. Now remember, when it comes to secret invasion, the campaign of the scrolls was launched in two fronts. The first one 
was basically duplicating superheroes and then sending them to Earth and sending the superhero community into a state of disarray because you basically have like Iron Man fighting Iron Man or Luke Cage fighting Luke Cage and the superheroes themselves are kind of asking each other, are you a scroll? Are you not a scroll? And so it creates distrust among the superhero community, which is already fractured in the aftermath of Civil War. And so that fracture begins to go even deeper. The other part of this was just a traditional invasion, right? Aliens arriving on Earth and just attacking people. And so that's really what kind of goes on here. They arrive at a baseball game. And of course, you've got the mascot kind of walking around doing mascot stuff. Now, the thing about this is it is a Deadpool comic. It's not going to be serious. It's going to be comedic. <laughs> just the nature of things. And so, in fact, when they show up here, they talk about the nature of like the spirit of competition that people have. And so it's one of those things where they're like, it's kind of ironic that this, this race of human beings that's trying to find some measure of peace constantly engages in competitive attitudes, which basically have their entire basis in warlike tendencies. So literally the human race is leaning into its wartime or its warlike mentality while trying to avoid its warlike mentality at the same time. But the funny thing about this is they basically have like this mascot, right? So literally they analyze everybody here and they're like, okay, so basically like they're all humans except for that guy. Now, the scrolls don't know what mascots are. <laughs> they have no idea that it's basically a human being running around inside of an animal costume and trying to trying to hype up a crowd, which sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But once they analyze this mascot, they realize that it's armed and it's wearing body armor. And outside of basically any sporting event in the south side of Chicago, why in the world would a mascot need to be armed and wear body armor, right? Like a Kevlar suit. <laughs> So they end up firing on it and literally like nothing happens, but the mascot just like, like it looks like it's dead, but it looks like it's like, like totally taken out. But then like it immediately pops up and it's Deadpool with bullet holes and everything and just opens fire on these guys with advanced weaponry. Now, the funny thing here is at that point, they were like, okay, obviously this guy's like some kind of an issue. We got to deal with this guy, right? We'll take him out, but they don't really see him as being like overly important, right? And that's one of the funny things is Deadpool is usually one of those guys where he's underestimated by people who don't know who he is. But the funny thing is like, as they're monitoring this whole thing, they're sending down troops, right? To basically take care of what's, you know, those individual people who were there to take care of Deadpool, but he's just tearing them to pieces. One, because of his advanced healing factor, right? So he can basically heal from pretty much anything. And two, because of the fact that the guy's got just firearms and just unloading everything on everyone. Now, one of the funny situations is when those soldiers get down there, Deadpool has like the second secondary voice in his head. So one of the things that's happened when it came to Deadpool and Marvel Comics and kind of a quick little history here is you had Deadpool who was originally introduced by Rob Liefeld, right? So he was like the super high octane, fast paced superhero of like the 1990s, more of an anti-hero than anything else, but you didn't really know where his allegiances lie. He fought Wolverine and Cable for a little while that bolstered his popularity because they were so popular. And then he started dropping off in popularity because people stopped buying comics. In the late 1990s, basically Joe Kelly started writing Deadpool, gave him more of like a dark humor where he broke the fourth wall a couple times. Christopher Priest got his hands on Deadpool and he started breaking the fourth wall all the time. And then Marvel started bringing in things like additional voices inside of his head to where he would basically talk to himself. And these different voices have represented different aspects of his character, but that's why you literally see him just conversing with a voice in his own head because it's kind of his moral compass to a degree. So it's almost like the narrator explaining what's going on. But the thing about this is that as he's in this situation and he's facing off against these scrolls, <laughs> as in insane as it is, he basically starts seeing these scrolls in a way where they're like, oh my god, is that Deadpool? Holy cow, Deadpool, we love you, man. Can we get your autograph? And that's when he's like, I'm I'm hallucinating again, aren't I? And the voice in his head's like, yeah, basically. Because, like, they're shooting at him. <laughs> and so he just starts attacking all these guys, just starts pummeling them. And so, because of the fact that he's just demolishing all these scroll forces, they do the only thing they can do, right? Because at this point, their commander is just kind of frustrated and he's fed up, right? He's like, okay, this guy keeps cracking jokes. He's taken out our forces. Like, come on guys, it's one man. We're, we're like the, the scroll empire, which has achieved interstellar travel. We should be able to take this guy out fairly quickly. But the problem with this is like, as they're attacking this guy, like as they're attacking Deadpool, he's crushing their forces. And so they end up firing on him using their ships like weapons cannons, right? Which basically like annihilates the mascot body, which leads them to believe that like he's been killed. The problem is when they get to the mascot, he's not there. Like he's gone. And in fact, he's on top
top of the ship. And so what they end up doing and realizing that is they dispatch the super scroll. Now the super scroll is kind of the scrolls sort of prime weapon, right? Technically speaking, the super scroll was basically a member of the scroll race who had all the powers of the fantastic four. What goes on here in secret invasion is that the super scroll has kind of changed its purpose to where it's basically a combination of different superheroes powers. So really it's not really the super scroll in the traditional sense. It's not a scroll that has the powers of the fantastic four. It's just a super scroll that has a variety of powers unto themselves, right? So kind of borrowing that concept and changing it up a little bit. But what ends up happening is with Deadpool basically on this ship, he starts planting these bombs and then detonates them and actually incapacitates the ship, destroys the scroll ship. And so when that happens, the whole thing comes crashing down onto Super Scroll and basically takes him out. And so with everybody basically, you know, at least the, the idea of them being dead, you have Deadpool who rolls into the scene, right? And it's like, okay, he finds the commander of the scroll army, right? That guy's basically alive. He finds the commander, he walks up on him and he's like, okay, so here's the thing, right? He's like, tell me, does your scroll medical plan cover massive head wounds <laughs> a bullet to the dome right like two in the dome piece and so this guy's like whatever like you know if you expect me to beg for my life that's not gonna happen like i'm not gonna beg and plead whatever do your worst and so deadpool goes to pull the trigger and it's a fake gun right one of those little pop guns it just says bang and the guy's like what in the world is going on here right and so of course the super scroll re-emerges he attacks deadpool <laughs> and so he literally seizes him and he's like did you really believe you could take on the full might of the scroll empire and deadpool's response is no, no 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 you 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 don't understand right like you're misinterpreting everything right this is all part of my plan now the reality is this is not deadpool's plan it's somebody else's plan deadpool's working for another guy and it's one of the coolest things because deadpool's like okay just so you guys know i'm not here to attack you i was here to get your attention i was here to show you you need a guy like me on your side if your entire secret invasion event is going to go off without a hitch so Here's the deal, Wade Wilson reporting for duty. I'm here to join your cause. I'm here to help you annihilate the entirety of the superhero community. Deadpool kills the Marvel Universe. <laughs> but the thing about this is kind of continuing this on, right? This sort of shows us or, or covers the continuing invasion of the scrolls against Earth. Now, one of the cool things about this is we're gonna get this revelation that may or may not be true. And I'm curious to see which one you guys believe. Right? I'm curious to see how you guys feel about this. But what this does is it picks up after the collapse of the shield helicarrier, right? Remember, that was one of the, the strikes that was launched by the scrolls. They launched a multifaceted strike against earth that initially they launched a strike against the superheroes by literally just crash landing a vessel into the savage land and when the various superheroes had responded to it that you ended up having them met by their former counterparts right and we just didn't know which one was which right was the spider-man who had shown up in the savage land what he's the real spider-man or was it the one that came out of the ship we didn't really know exactly what was going on and that was part of the confusion that the scrolls were creating is throwing out doppelgangers and then forcing the superheroes on earth to actually question whether or not they were scrolls and then to question their teammates right just kind of sowing doubt the other part of this was them launching a traditional attack in the city of new york as well as other places around the world in addition to taking down shield their technology as well as stark tech right so basically blinding all forms of intelligence on earth so nobody really knows what's going on right so when you end up having maria hill who again is the current director of shield in marvel comics at least at the time the story is being written when she takes off to the surface of the helicarrier, she's met by Jarvis. Now, Jarvis is historically the Avengers butler. The fact that he's here and the fact that the attack was launched, of course, putting two and two together, Jarvis is a scroll, which we already knew for the most part, right? He was the one that helped to orchestrate the attack that took down S.H.I.E.L.D. and Stark Tech at the same time. But the fact that Jarvis is an inside man for the scrolls is a big deal because the Avengers are pretty knowledgeable about how S.H.I.E.L.D. works. The fact that Jarvis is a bad guy here means he's basically basically able to bring down the Avengers, right? Which is a pretty significant moment. The other part of this is we basically switch over to Camp Hammond. Now, this requires a bit of explanation. For those of you guys who aren't really familiar with Marvel Comics, Camp Hammond 
is one and really kind of the main site of the initiative. So the way this worked in Marvel Comics is that as most of you guys know, you had Civil War. And again, we've talked about this before. So for those of you guys who are familiar with this, bear with me here for a second. When it came to Civil War, as most of you guys know, it was all fought over superhero registration, right? That if you were a person out there that had superpowers, whether you intended to use them or not, you had to register your name, your address, the whole nine yards with the federal government. Those individuals who didn't want to sided with Captain America. Those individuals who did sided with Iron Man. And this led to a giant rift in the superhero community. Ultimately, Iron Man, Reed Richards, Hank Pym, Ant-Man, those guys who were on the side of registration, they effectively won. And what they ended up doing was implementing the 50 state initiative, which was literally a government sanctioned superhero team in all 50 states. In terms of planning, it was pretty great, right? It was pretty awesome. And the reality is I always sided with registration because what that does is it basically holds people accountable. Whereas people like Captain America didn't want to be held accountable for the things they did, right? Otherwise they would have been on the side of registration. And so what this means is that at Camp Hammond, you have a kind of coming together of what is in effect the most capable members of the 50 state initiative. Not everybody from the initiative is here. It's basically like the top of the class, right? Like those individuals who are like in the 1% of the class, they get straight A's for lack of a better analogy here. But they're basically gathered because no one knows exactly what's going on, or at least they're not being made aware of what's going on. Now, eventually they're told by some of the individuals like Diamondback who kind of run the initiative program in the absence of Hank Pym and those guys and essentially saying like they don't know where the Avengers are, communications with S.H.I.E.L.D. and Iron Man and all that stuff is down, right? Like nobody knows how to get anybody. They're literally flying blind. But then Hank Pym basically shows up out of nowhere and tells them like there's an attack in the city of New York. This is what you've been training for. We have to go respond. Now that's one of the things to understand. The idea behind the initiative and it was an actual comic book line. It wasn't very good, but it was an actual comic book line. Uh, the idea was to literally train them and get them prepared so they could actually be superheroes that could help alongside the Avengers. But that's all they would really be for the most part. I mean, the ones who were like the absolute best, they would go on and join the Avengers proper. But for the most part, the Avengers initiative program was kind of like, if we need help, we will call you, right? Until you've proved that you're a person that can actually stand on the battlefield in a meaningful capacity. The reality here though, is that this is kind of an all hands on deck situation. And so where you have all these scrolls who had invaded the city of New York, and they're all basically using some variation of a combination of superhero powers or just direct duplicates of superheroes, Wolverine, Iron Man, different things like that, that you do have like Vision who's here. You also have the Young Avengers right now. Here's the kind of caveat here because you're going to notice Wiccan around here. When it comes to Wiccan, those of you guys who aren't familiar with him, Wiccan is ridiculously powerful, right? Like as the son of the Scarlet Witch, arguably he's more powerful than she is depending on what era of comics you're reading and where his powers are. He is destined to become the uh, the Demiurge, basically meaning he's going to be the most powerful being on Earth and quite literally one of the most powerful beings in the universe. He hasn't quite reached that point yet because he doesn't have fine-tuned control of his abilities on that scale. But this is one of those moments where basically Brian Michael Bendis invokes a character that's stupidly powerful, but you never actually see him use the full totality of his abilities. It's just kind of the way Brian Michael Bendis writes he's very inconsistent with his writing style but at the end of the day of course you have hulkling who initially responds now hulkling is half scroll he's not a hulk right despite his name <laughs> i know you're like my initial thought when they first introduced hulkling when i first got into him was like okay we don't know his entire basis is he like the son of the hulk or something like that no he's just half scroll but he is a shapeshifter and he is a cool character but the thing about this is because he's half scroll he initially tries to play diplomat right like hey guys i'm half scroll it's cool you guys gotta stop you can't do this, but one of the things to remember is the scroll empire as it exists now, it, it really takes place in the aftermath of Galactus destroying pretty much their entire homeworld, as well as a whole host of the scrolls being obliterated themselves during the annihilation event. So all you really have left of the scroll empire is basically just a religiously guided race, which is being led by their queen for the most part. And so because of that, they're really here with religious fanaticism, right? Like we are are destined to take this place. This is like our manifest destiny, essentially. And they're looking to conquer it, right? Like that's that's kind of what their goal is here. And as a result of that, there's no way to really bargain with them, right? I mean, when you have an individual who is guided by religious zealotry, whatever the religious figure is, that's the only person they're going to listen to. And so in the absence of that religious figure, they will believe the person that they 
identify with the most, who claims to speak on behalf of that religious figure. In times of desperation, people will believe what they want to believe. And in the instance of this, it's the scrolls believing that their, their end is nigh. When a religious figure pops up in the case of the queen and saying, I can lead us to greener pastures, they will follow her with unwavering loyalty. And that's exactly what's happening here. That's why you can't bargain with them. That's why you can't talk them down because they believe it's their mission from their gods to conquer earth. And so where you do have the initiative that steps in and does what they can, for the most part, they're a stopgap measure. It's sticking a piece of bubble gum on a leak in a wall, right? It's going to hold for a little bit, but they're not going to save the day. And so what this does is it switches over to the Savage Land with basically Jessica Drew, Spider Woman. Now, previously we had talked about how the queen was impersonating somebody. She was going forward to claim to be someone in the Secret Invasion event. This is it, right? She claims to be Spider Woman, right? Like she literally took on the form of Spider Woman. Now, here's the thing to understand. There's more that goes on here than simply the scrolls just taking on the form of a person they have a whole process and it's really really cool it's pretty badass but of course when she shows up here she immediately takes out echo now of course a lot of you guys may know echo from the hawkeye tv series she's been around in marvel comics for a little while she was never important no one ever really cared about her she was just there occasionally and did some stuff and was interesting sometimes i guess it wasn't until marvel decided they were going to put her in the hawkeye show that in the comics they started to elevate her they gave her the phoenix force and all that kind of stuff here's the funny thing people still don't care so i mean she's not an interesting character and she never was <laughs> she's not cool because she's basically taskmaster right like she can copy the fighting styles of other people been there done that right i mean that's literally all it is when it comes to her character so that's why people never really cared about her too much but the thing about this is jessica drew takes out echo immediately like right off the bat incapacitates her now there is a reason why the queen chose spider woman above everybody else and we'll cover that when we go into like the transformation process when the scrolls take on the form of somebody else because there is a huge motivation and it's really really cool but what she ends up doing is basically traveling to see tony stark now one of the things to know is that when the secret invasion event first kicked off and like technology really like stark tech and everything went offline what it also meant is that tony stark's suit was not really capable of keeping his body safe the way that it previously had he's literally dying right that's literally what's happening his fever is like 102 his body he's basically shutting down and so he's trying to find a way to get his suit back up and running again now the thing about this is when jessica shows up he's kind of like look no offense girl but like i don't really want to talk to anybody i have to focus on trying to find a way to fix this suit now under any normal circumstance tony stark would do this in an instant right this suit would be sorted out quick fast and in a hurry but one of the things to remember is that they're in the savage land right and we talked about this in a previous video the savage land is out there in antarctica somewhere sure it's been a place that's been explored and used by multiple people people over the years, Mr. Sinister, Magneto, right? Like Kazar, who nobody cares about. He's basically Marvel's Tarzan, right? Like it's been used by a lot of different people, but the technology is archaic, right? So this is basically Tony Stark trying to fix his suit in a cave with a box of scraps. That's literally what this is, <laughs> right? He can only do so much with the archaic technology that's available here. But the funny thing is that when Jessica shows up, when the queen shows up here, she actually starts screwing with the mind of Tony Stark. Stark, right what she says is like your work on earth is done right thank you tony stark for everything that you've accomplished here and he's like what in the world are you talking about right and her response is you will go down in our people's history as the greatest soldier the armada has ever had and you will always and forever have my undying love the love of your queen and where she's trying to convince tony stark that he's a scroll he refuses to believe that it's true but here's one of the things to remember this is him speaking and it's really him just trying to convince himself that's the kicker here right and again we'll go more into this process in a future video but when the scrolls take on the form of superheroes it's not just copying them they believe they're that person it's one of the things that tony stark figured out right at the very beginning of the story that we started covering here it's one of the things that tony stark realized when electra was revealed to be a scroll 
control. The reason why her mind couldn't be read by telepaths and they couldn't figure out that she was a scroll, the reason why she didn't smell like a scroll to Wolverine is because for all intents and purposes and by all standards of measurement, they are that person, right? They genuinely believe that they are that person. And so when the queen comes along and uses that information against Tony Stark, it leads Tony Stark down the path of doubting himself. Perhaps I really am a scroll, which is why he's trying to basically convince himself in saying this as opposed to talking to her. And it's kind of the funny thing because she says like, you performed admirably, Tony Stark. None of this would have been possible had it not been for you, right? You initiated the superhero civil war. You became director of shield. You're the one that basically ignored the entirety of the scrolls secretly replacing all of these different superheroes on earth. Had it not been for you, we never would have been able to pull this off. Now, this conversation is ridiculously important, especially when it comes to the end of secret invasion. And then you start going into dark rain, which we may or may not cover. I don't know if we're going to do that or not. It's a cool story arc. It's not really an event. It's more of like a branding initiative, but I'll make sense of it. Once we get closer to the end of secret invasion, or once we get to the end of secret invasion. But the thing about this is that it's a really, really important conversation here, but in a lot of ways, she's using the history of Tony Stark against him because he did initiate the superhero civil war and he did become director of shield. And it was under his watch as director of shield that the scrolls were secretly replacing superheroes. He was part of the Illuminati. The Illuminati were the ones who went to the scroll homeworld in the first place and set all this in motion by telling the scrolls never to visit earth, right? You remember when we covered that one shot, the scrolls had incapacitated the Illuminati and started analyzing their DNA and came to the realization we can copy their superpowers, right? It's not simply us just taking on their forms. If we explore this possibility long enough, not only can we copy the forms of superheroes on earth, we can copy their powers and then we can make it impossible for them to detect the fact that we are scrolls, right? We can push this to its limit. And so jumping back to Manhattan, back at Times Square, where this main event's going on, as you would expect, the initiative is getting absolutely wrecked, right? And the crazy thing about this is that this is all being recorded. It's all being broadcast live on TV. So quite literally, the entirety of the earth is watching as the superheroes in New York, who are really like the last stand, right? They're the ones that are supposed to keep the world protected. They're getting obliterated by the forces of the scrolls. Even Vision is destroyed by the scrolls themselves. Because remember, they've been prepping for this war for quite some time. They've been studying the superheroes long enough to know how to overcome their various abilities. So destroying Vision, destroying these other members of the superhero community, all basically seems lost. But in the midst of all of this, everything around the entirety of New York starts to shake. Literally, the whole city starts shaking. And what ends up happening is Nick Fury and his howling commandos emerge with Daisy Johnson leading the charge. Now, here's something that I want to solidify here, right? And this it's one of the things that I hated the most about Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was a cool show. It was an interesting show. They depowered Quake so bad. It was ridiculous. Ridiculous. Daisy Johnson in the comics is stupidly powerful. I mean, she's one of these characters where this it's arguable that she's Omega level because she can literally create earthquakes to the point that she can actually shatter worlds. It's nuts how overpowered she is, right? In the show, she was, it was, I mean, I get the MCU depowers people. That's just the nature of things. It's just how the MCU works, but she was so weak compared to her comic book version. And that's going to be nuts because while Nick Fury's team is here and they, they are going to put a dent in the scrolls. Even Daisy Johnson's power and her ability to create earthquakes on virtually any scale is not really going to be enough to turn the tide. What we end up doing here is we initially pick up with Deadpool right now. As you guys know, Deadpool in the last video that we talked about had basically joined the scrolls, quote unquote. What we're going to end up finding out is this is just a giant ruse that what Deadpool does is he kind of pitches himself to the scrolls in the sense that he's a guy who's always kind of been cast out from the superhero community. And in that way, it's true, right? That's an actual accurate statement by Deadpool. The superhero community had never really taken him that seriously at all. And so as a kind of cast out himself, he wanted to basically end the entirety of the Earth's population, or at least that's how he pitched himself, right? He was siding with the scrolls. And so what he ends up doing is effectively telling them that because he is so unique regarding his healing factor, well, the scrolls are initially gonna take him out and then just copy his healing factor and call it a day. His response is, but like, they don't, they don't know how to 
fight like I fight, right? It's one thing to have my healing factor, but at that point, you're just throwing an endless number of scrolls at the superheroes in the hopes that you can somehow defeat them. Whereas if I can train your scroll soldiers how to fight once they have my healing factor, you can do whatever you want with me, but in effect, you won't have to kill so many of your own kind. And that's one of the things to keep in mind. While the scrolls do see this as a wartime campaign, and while they are willing to make sacrifices to achieve their goal, they're not willing to throw lives away we're going, you know, in order to, to, to have it done, right? They're not Russia during World War II. <laughs> they're not killing retreating soldiers. And so as a result of this, Deadpool literally takes those scrolls who have been given his healing factor and starts training them how to fight. But as you guys know, Deadpool's crazy as hell. So not only does he teach them how to fight, he also basically turns them into crazy people. Now, initially the scrolls don't quite know what to make of this. And they're kind of like, I mean, these guys going nuts like this, are they supposed to be doing that? And it's like, well, we have to trust Deadpool. Right? We have to trust that this guy knows what he's doing, that he knows what he's talking about. The funny thing about this is that as time goes on, he basically gets these guys to a point where they all literally start killing each other. Right, like all these scroll soldiers that have been given Deadpool's healing factor all basically just start taking each other out. And the reason why this matters is because one, Deadpool had basically had these weapons retrofitted so these guys could be destroyed if they needed to be. But the second thing behind this is that this is all a ploy. Right, this is all a ruse. The whole purpose behind Deadpool doing this was to gain the trust of the scrolls to get inside their ship so he could feed information. And he's giving this information to Nick Fury. Now, I told you guys at the very beginning of Secret Invasion, when we covered this, and as always, you'll find a link to the playlist down in the description so you can get caught up, that what Nick Fury had been doing was secretly operating behind the scenes in order to secure every bit of information he could from every source he could. And so that's exactly what's going on here. Now, as for what's going on back on Earth and actually in the satellite itself, we switch over to Abigail Brand. Now remember, Abigail Brand is the leader of S.W.O.R.D., which is basically S.H.I.E.L.D., except they monitor space. And where their space station was like one of the first things to be taken out by the scrolls, that way humanity was blinded in terms of what was going on out in space, which of course allowed the scroll forces to basically properly invade. That Abigail Brand had also learned that Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four had been taken by the scrolls. Now, a lot of that was done just because of the fact that when it came to the scrolls themselves, Reed Richards, his intelligence is universally recognized. He's largely basically seen as the smartest person in the universe. So having his knowledge at their disposal and really kind of tormenting and torturing him due to the fact that he was part of the original Illuminati, that having him there is a huge asset for the empire. With Abigail Brand basically being the leader of S.W.O.R.D. and then freeing Reed Richards, they end up basically transporting back to Earth. And then, of course, we transition over to Maria Hill, whose helicarrier was taken down by the Skrull forces and ultimately ambushed by Jarvis, who's normally the Avengers butler, but turned out to be a Skrull. Now, one of the things that she was told early on by Nick Fury, of course, again, if you guys recall when the two of them had met, that Nick Fury had said, make sure you get some life model decoys. You're surrounded by nothing but enemies. You just don't know it yet. Maria Hill, despite the fact that she is exceedingly arrogant in Marvel Comics, despite the fact that she usually always always believes she's right and can never really admit when she's wrong, ultimately ended up going with the information Nick Fury gave her. Because if Nick Fury is nothing, it's usually always correct. And so as a result of that, she basically got a life model decoy. And so when Jarvis and his forces open up on Maria Hill, when they open fire on her, it's of course a life model decoy they destroy, which allows the real Maria Hill to basically take off. And so what we end up doing is kind of joining the rest of the superheroes on Earth and basically the, the conclusion of the secret invasion event, at least the proper conclusion to this event, right? So switching over to Deadpool, what ends up happening here is of course, Deadpool with all these forces being taken out, the initial intention of the scrolls is to locate and find Deadpool. They end up sending Super Scroll after him. Of course, Deadpool takes that guy out pretty easily. I mean, that's one of the things to know is that at the end of the day, Deadpool's easily able to overcome those guys because when it comes to the Super Scroll, he's just an amalgamation of the Earth superhero powers, right? Deadpool's face off against those guys multiple times. So he knows how to basically overcome all of them. And so what this does is he basically ends up leading what's left of these scroll soldiers who have all started mutating and everything now and literally destroys the Deadpool scrolls, right? As well as what's left of the scroll forces. Following that, he ends up taking information that would be paramount to destroying the secret invasion fleet, right? The scroll fleet. And he essentially teleports it or sends it to Nick Fury. The crazy thing about this is that while this is bio data, right? That can basically kill, kill the scroll queen. 
when the information's sent, it's supposed to go to Nick Fury, but instead, it's intercepted by Norman Osborn. Now, that's why I told you guys, when we covered the Thunderbolt story, Norman Osborn was going to be the single most important character in this story, or at least one of the most important characters in this whole story, because it's this action right here that basically changes everything, right? So, what we end up doing is switching back to Earth when the scrolls basically make their statement to the world at large. And it's really cool because what they say here is, as you know, your global communication systems are fully restored. We apologize for the inconvenience of taking them down. This is a time for unheralded transition for your world as it becomes part of the scroll empire. For those of you who are understandably confused and panicked, let me explain it to you very clearly. Your lives will go on as they were. You get to keep your homes, your culture, your family, your jobs. We are not taking anything away from you. We're only adding things. You'll notice that the Scroll Empire has made no offensive moves towards your armies or your governments. We have only defended ourselves when necessary, and we request that all armed forces ignore whatever orders you've received from your superior officers and stand down. Now, this is a very important thing on a variety of different levels. What Brian Michael Bendis is doing here is actually drawing on the superhero's perception and really the world's perception following a story called Maximum Security. So Maximum Security was a story that was written in Marvel Comics back in the 90s, I think. And the whole idea behind this is that the, the, the Kree race had actually taken over Earth and turned it into a prison planet. And in fact, Ron and the Accuser was basically the warden of Earth at that point in time, meaning humanity has been down this road before. And so when the scrolls show up here and it's like, hey, 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 guys, we're here, we're on your side, we're not going to take anything away from you, yada, yada, yada. What they're in effect saying here is that we're not going to do what the Kree did during maximum security. We're not going to turn you into prisoners. Your lives will continue on the way they always had. You won't really notice a discernible difference here. Now, the other part of this is the scrolls are lying, right? They're literally asking soldiers to basically ignore orders from their superior officers, which would make it easier for the scrolls to basically take them all out. But it's also a very, very smart maneuver because of what use is a military officer if he's surrounded by soldiers that won't obey his orders. But following Reed Richards basically arriving at the Savage Land with Abigail Brand, at this point, with Reed Richards' arrival, because he's been stuck on the scroll ship all this time, once he's here, they're able to tell pretty fast that it's actually Reed. And following that, he literally galvanizes the superheroes and brings them together. Now, a lot of that's because one of the things to remember is the Fantastic Four is like the first family of Marvel Comics. So in a lot of ways, even though the Fantastic Four don't usually get involved in the traditional superhero antics, meaning they're not facing off against like Thanos or something like that, they're usually out exploring things. A lot of that's because they've done their dirt, quote unquote, right? They fought their share of bad guys and they've done their thing. They've kind of moved beyond that, right? They've been promoted to a managerial position. <laughs> it's the best analogy that I can make. And so with that in mind, Reed Richards is highly respected by the superhero community, which is why they listen to him, right? That and his level of intelligence and so on. But the other part of this is, again, Tony Stark struggling. Now, there's what Tony Stark struggles with publicly, then there's what Tony Stark struggles with privately. Publicly, people are just kind of like, you know, his, his statement to people is, Stark Tech is down and this and this and that and that and so on and so forth. What he actually struggles with on a more private level is that the world's going to see him as a failure. Because remember, at this point in time in Marvel Comics, this takes place after Civil War, which means Tony Stark is the director of S.H.I.E.L.D. All this happened under his watch, and the world is going to ask the question, why? And when that question does get asked, he's ultimately going to end up losing his position. He knows that, and in fact, we know that. And so what's really cool about this is you kind of have people responding, right? The average person responding in a couple different ways. Some actually side with the scrolls, right? If humanity could get it together, humanity would have already gotten it together. Like the fact that humanity just hasn't gotten it together yet means humanity doesn't want to. So if, he, if the human race won't change, then someone needs to force the human race to change. And the scrolls are doing that. And so is that a good thing? Because the, the, the cost of that is that the world would be basically turned into a prison planet. And so again, this presents some really interesting philosophical arguments to how this kind of situation can be approached. But the reality is that it's the superheroes facing off against the scrolls, which is one of the reasons why I always love this story, because one of the ideas that I've always put out there is that superheroes don't really exist to like make the world better. Superheroes exist to maintain the status quo, right? You could argue 
superheroes are actually the bad guys. So it's really interesting, you know, in terms of how things function. But nonetheless, what this does is this actually coincides with the return of Thor. Now, here's the thing to understand about this, right? One of the things to know is that not only is Thor here, but you also have Bucky Captain America. So Secret Invasion was one of those stories that Marvel wrote where it was kind of a transitionary story. Think of it as one of many that Marvel was writing at the time that were like the equivalent of Empire Strikes Back in the Star Wars mythos, right? That this was a story that was designed to one, properly introduce us or really have us see the real and new Bucky Barnes Captain America. He did get his own solo comic for a time, but Steve Rogers was killed. He was assassinated by uh, by Agent 13, Sharon Carter, who had basically been duped, right? She was more or less being hit and ties when it was done by the Red Skull and his forces. So Bucky Barnes ended up taking up the mantle and Bucky Barnes became the new Captain America. But the other part about this is that during the events of Thor Disassembled or Thor Ragnarok, as it's colloquially known by fans, that that was the death of Thor, right? During the events of Civil War, Tony Stark had cloned Thor, and that's where you got the Ragnarok cyborg version. But this version you see here is the one that returned during J. Michael Straczynski's run. He's been traveling around Earth and basically waking up the Asgardian spirits or the essences of the various Asgardians who, were, who have basically been reborn in human form, and then bringing them to Asgard, which he had rebuilt in Broxton, Oklahoma. And so that's kind of been his thing for a little bit now. And this actually takes place after the events of basically Thor beating the hell out of Iron Man. If you guys never saw that, it was a, just an amazing moment. I'm pretty sure we did a video on it. It was really, really cool. But the thing about this is that it's kind of the superheroes returning to a degree, right? Kind of stepping back into the normal landscape. And so again, what you end up getting here is just a great big, huge, massive battle that takes place between the scroll forces and Earth's superheroes. Pretty straightforward, not a whole lot doing here. This one of the things that I hope you guys notice is that the Marvel Cinematic Universe very much models the the form and function of its movies after the way that Marvel Comics writes their comic books, right? Like, here's the exposition, here's what's going on. Now, time for the big battle, which is always the same, no matter what movie you're watching, <laughs> right? It's that kind of a thing, right? It's, it's the way it works. And honestly, it's a multi-billion dollar franchise. Who's to argue against that? Although I do think it's time for the MCU to start changing and I'll, I'll make a video on that, you know, on, uh, on my video essays on Geek Culture Explained, which will be coming at some point in the future. No, I haven't abandoned that channel. So here's the thing, right? What this massive battle is taking place here, it's pretty straightforward. Again, it's heroes fighting scrolls and that that's really more or less it, right? Just kind of a battle between these characters and really things are pretty straightforward. The big thing about this is remember, Jessica Drew is the Scroll Queen. It's the person she chose to be. We covered that in the last video, that the Scroll Queen chose Jessica Drew because of her kind of time basically gravitating around the superhero landscape. She's friends with Spider-Man. She's been a part of the Avengers. She is associated with the X-Men, even if she's not the closest person to them. She's been a uh, an agent that's worked with Hydra. She literally has had her hands in everything. So to basically take control of her or to replace her means to have access to the entirety of really the superhero and even supervillain landscape in Marvel Comics. Now, of course, as is always when it comes to stuff like this, you have the Watcher who appears because, you know, in the mid-2000s, the Watcher always showed up. It was like, oh, this is this event is going to be a big event and everything's going to change because of this. It was it stopped mattering after a while, which is always kind of disappointing. But as the battle rages on and the Earth's superheroes were able to overcome the forces of the scrolls at least in terms of this battle basically the scroll queen is the only one left but she refuses to give ground because she's a religious believer she's driven by religious convictions she truly believes that earth is the rightful place of the scroll empire following the almost complete destruction of their race during annihilation and the destruction of their homeworld by galactus and so because she's driven by such convictions she refuses to give ground so this ultimately leads to wolverine launching an attack with the intention of killing her, but she's killed before that happens. And it's done by Norman Osborn because Norman is the one who intercepts the information from Deadpool that the Scroll Queen is the one you have to assassinate. And here's the person that she is. She's Jessica Drew. That's the whole reason why Norman Osborn even sent the Thunderbolts into this battle in the first place. Under any normal circumstance, Norman Osborn wouldn't really care. And in fact, he would sit back and wait to 
see which side he should choose based on which side is most likely to win. If the Earth superheroes are most likely to win, it's, hey guys, the Thunderbolts are here to help. I mean, we're, no, we're not going to change the tide, but like, we have to do something here, right? We've just been dealing with our own major crisis. Or if the Scrolls were winning, then it's just like, hey Scrolls, I'm the guy you want on your side, right? Like that kind of a thing. Now, the other part of this is that because this battle was so highly televised, the whole world sees Norman Osborn taking this killing blow, which means that as far as everybody is concerned, Norman Osborn is the one who ended the threat. Now that's immensely important here because what we end up finding out is that without the Scroll Queen and without any kind of a superior officer, no one knows who to take their orders from. And so literally the whole scroll, not really the race, but those individuals who are here, they kind of fall into disarray and disorganization, which is long enough for those superheroes that can operate in space, Thor and Captain Marvel and those guys, to basically take out the scroll forces that are out there and so once the dust settles and everything is all cleared up it basically leads to tony stark and literally destroying pretty much all of the ships out there except for one and the reason why is because on that ship are the superheroes that were replaced with scroll duplicates that's kind of been the question that a lot of you guys have been asking you've you've basically been wondering if the scrolls have replaced superheroes what happened to the original superheroes basically they just kind of been sitting on a ship this is kind of a brian michael bendis hand wavy explanation right like i mean why didn't because literally in the comic the questions asked why didn't the scrolls just kill them after they duplicated them and it's like well they they, they probably needed them for genetic material in case you know they could somehow increase their abilities or something like that it's literally marvel just kind of hand waving the explanation away but the fact is all these different superheroes have all essentially returned and so that's when the discussion starts to be had where do we go from here how does everybody pick up these pieces how does it all make sense and one of the things that we find out here is that because tony stark had failed because tony stark had never seen the secret invasion coming that what the u.s government literally did was stand against Tony Stark. They kicked him out as director of S.H.I.E.L.D. Right? They were like, you were literally, you had all the world's intelligence at your disposal. Right? You're the one that said after Civil War that you could keep us safe, that you could protect us from the various threats of the world. The first threat we get, which is the, the scrolls secretly replacing superheroes, you miss. Right? You are a terrible director of S.H.I.E.L.D. They kick him out and they replace him with Norman Osborn. Now, a lot of you guys are probably asking, how can Norman Osborn be replaced? The reality here is that the government is really more about public perception than anything else. And as far as the world is concerned, Norman Osborn saved the day. You combine that with Norman Osborn's nickel slick smile and his silver tongue. And there's literally no question that this guy could weasel his way in. The funny thing about this is that as soon as Norman Osborn is made the new director of S.H.I.E.L.D. and he's basically given Avengers Tower, right? They hand it to him. This guy runs in Avengers Tower now. As soon as it's handed over to him, he goes into an elevator, he goes to an underground bunker, he meets with Namor the Submariner, Mephisto, Loki, who's a chick now, Emma Frost from the Hellfire Club, kind of the X-Men, she's kind of a good guy, bad guy, and Doctor Doom, forming his own cabal, and basically a initiating the events of Dark Reign. And Dark Reign was great. Oh my god, I loved Dark Reign. It's literally, like, Dark Reign, for those of you guys who don't know, it's not really a story arc. It's not like Dark Reign Part 1, Part 2, Part 3. It's more like Dark Avengers, Dark X-Men, stuff like that. But it's basically Norman Osborn's attempt to use the forces of S.H.I.E.L.D. to conquer the world. It's awesome. It's just, it's one of the coolest stories that Marvel had written for a long, long time. But with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. Thank you all for watching, and I will catch you all later. Peace.